We'd like to tell you a bit about what it's like to be a disease detective. And for those of you who saw the movie Contagion, Kate Winslet is a disease detective there, and actually it's pretty realistic. Uh, being a disease detective is really interesting. It is the boots on the ground experience of what CDC does 24 seven to keep all of us safe. And uh, EIS officers, the EIS program is more than 60 years old. It's trained more than 3,000 people, and it's a really unique type of training. It's called the Epidemic Intelligence Service, and a very clever fellow more than 60 years ago figured that if he could highlight that we needed this kind of specialist to protect ourselves from biological warfare, he could probably get funding from Congress for it. And it would both protect us from biological warfare and protect us from lots of other health threats. And that's what it's done for more than 60 years. Uh, the whole gamut of health problems are things that EIS officers can potentially investigate. I started with CDC in 1990 as an EIS officer. I was assigned to New York City. And as often, or maybe even usually happens, the person who rang the alarm bell and called the health department was an alert clinician. An alert clinician, in this case, called us and said, I think I'm seeing a lot more drug-resistant tuberculosis. Why don't you figure out what's going on? And that call basically took 10 years to answer. Uh, because first, we had to figure out what was going on in New York City. And we found that, in fact, we had a lot of multidrug resistant tuberculosis, way more than had been anticipated. And we found that it was largely spreading in hospitals. So patients and healthcare workers were getting infected in hospitals, coming down with TB, going into hospitals, sometimes dying, and often making other patients sick. We were able to track the epidemic throughout New York City and we were able to apply the tools of epidemiology to control it. Uh, by shedding a light on it, we galvanized action and we changed medical treatment. We also identified where the lapses were, where the lesions were, what was going wrong with our treatment system that we were losing most of the patients that we were diagnosing. What was going wrong in our hospitals that healthcare workers and patients were getting infected. So we had to call team after team of EIS officers up as there were outbreaks in neonatal intensive care units. There were outbreaks on AIDS wards. There were outbreaks on, uh, uh, in public hospitals, in private hospitals, in the prison system, at, in homeless shelters, in the jail system, in crack dens. But little by little, we began to figure out what was going on. And very rapidly, we figured out what the answer was. The answer was that TB was spreading and that we could stop it because even drug-resistant tuberculosis, we could stop its spread by treating it and by isolating patients if needed. And what that allowed us to do was to rapidly reduce drug-resistant tuberculosis. In fact, so rapidly that when it, it plummeted after the first year, we sent a manuscript off to the New England Journal of Medicine asking them to publish this rapid control of drug-resistant tuberculosis after a decade of increasing with just basic good management, making sure people got treated, making sure it wasn't spread in hospitals. And the New England Journal wrote back and said, um, we're not sure it's a real trend. Wait another year and submit it again. So we waited a year and we came down another 15% in one year, really dramatic decline. And we sent it to them and they accepted it. But they said, but before we print it, could you tell us how it's going in the first quarter of this year? We're not really sure it's had this much progress. So one of the really rewarding things about solving a mystery isn't just the intellectual, the intellectual rewards of solving it, but the human rewards of the health benefit that comes from that. And uh, after that experience, I went over to India where uh, we helped the government of India implement a program that has resulted in millions of patients treated and millions of lives saved using the same system of establishing effective programs that can base decisions on data and find problems, identify them when they, when they come first. So let's just go uh, to, to uh, each of the officers to hear a little bit about what they're, they're doing. We're gonna start uh, with Neil um, on rabies, bad disease. Thanks, Dr. Frieden. Um, so like Dr. Frieden was saying, much of my work is actually focused on rabies, which is caused by a virus and is typically transmitted through the bite of an infected animal. And rabies is really a terrible disease. Virtually every person who gets rabies will, will unfortunately die. So last year in Maryland, a patient developed rabies, and I led the investigation to figure out how this patient had become exposed. 
because we wanted to prevent other people from getting this, uh, this sickness as well. This patient did not have any of the typical risk factors we associate with rabies, but he did have a history of kidney transplantation 18 months before his symptoms started. And so that got us thinking that maybe he had somehow been exposed to rabies through his organ transplantation. Now, organ transplantation is a life-saving intervention for a range of diseases, but rarely infections can actually be transmitted from organ donors to organ recipients, and that's what we thought might have happened here, that maybe the organ donor had actually died of rabies that no one recognized 18 months before, and it became our job to figure out, going back in time, whether or not the donor really had died of rabies that had gone unrecognized. So as you can imagine, it's not easy going back that far in time, but through some very extensive sleuth work, we were able to locate samples belonging to that donor that had been in a freezer for the last 18 months. And we got those specimens to CDC, and within hours of receiving them, we generated definitive results showing that indeed, the organ donor had died of rabies. <coughs> So at this point, we had proven that transmission had occurred through transplantation, but our job was not yet over. It turned out that there were three other people who had also received organs from that same donor, and these three people were still, much to our relief, alive. So now we were racing against time, because these three people had rabid organs inside of their body, and these are like ticking time bombs just waiting to release rabies. We immediately vaccinated these people and still to this day, they remain alive, which is an unprecedented situation. So one of the points that this investigation highlights is that link between animal and human health. Because in the course of our investigation, we found out that the donor was an avid hunter and had been bitten by raccoons multiple times, and that's probably how he had been exposed to rabies. Another animal known to have rabies are bats, and bats can also carry a range of other diseases, including viruses related to Ebola. And so some of the work I do is actually focused on how humans interact with bats so that we can prevent bat-related illnesses. And this type of work actually took me to Nigeria last year, where every year there's a bat festival that, is, uh, that takes place where people capture live bats from this cave, and then these bats are later prepared as food. But our concern was that in the course of this type of festivity, people might be getting exposed to deadly viruses. So some of you might be wondering why CDC would take an interest in an activity taking place on the other side of the planet. But you have to keep in mind, we live in an interconnected world. So a health threat anywhere is a health threat everywhere. And so by remaining vigilant for these types of risk factors, we can better prepare ourselves for the next outbreak. Animals often are the source of human outbreaks. In fact, about two thirds of all of the new diseases come from the animal kingdom. And Bats are a particularly problematic species because they're mammals. So the things that infect them might well infect us. And they live in huge colonies. So diseases once in a community can perpetuate themselves for a long time. And they travel long distances so they can spread it. I was last year in a cave in Africa called Python Cave. You can imagine why it's called Python Cave. I actually saw the python. It is enormous. <laughs> and our staff have done research in that cave to figure out how it is that the, an Ebola-like virus, this is a, these are terrible viruses that cause bleeding and death, called Marburg, uh, had killed one person and nearly killed another. And they had localized it to this python cave. Uh, and they had done research in this cave to capture bats, bleed them, release them, figure out what proportion carried the Marburg virus. And when I talked to the team that did this, I said, you know, weren't you scared? And they said, well, the bats didn't scare us uh, because we were wearing the, you know, the white protective uh, uh, equipment. Uh, and the python didn't scare us, but the, the cobras scared us. <laughs> um, and so underneath our white protective gear, we wore leather chaps. So if the uh, cobra struck, it wouldn't, wouldn't enter. Jennifer? Next slide, please. So um, one of the reasons researchers like Neil and others at CDC do investigate animals is this very thing. Emerging diseases in people are often traced back to animals. And one of these situations occurred in 2003. And the first hint we had that something had gone terribly wrong, you can see in this picture up here, this is a three-year-old girl who lived in Wisconsin. 
and she developed these very odd, very disturbing skin lesions. Now, I'm actually too young to have been vaccinated for smallpox. I was the first generation of kids who didn't get a smallpox vaccine. But there are many researchers at CDC who dedicated their early careers to eradicating this disease from the world. And they took one look at this picture and said, that's smallpox. So we were very, very worried, especially when a second case was reported just a few days later from another part of Wisconsin. These two patients didn't know each other. One's a three-year-old girl, one is a businessman, but they had one piece of history in common. They had both been bitten by sick pet prairie dogs. Who here has a pet prairie dog? It's not a good idea. <laughs> um, it's a very odd history, and we immediately began turning over in our head, could this be plague or tularemia? Those are two diseases that we know prairie dogs can carry, but these lesions look like smallpox. So they sent C uh, samples to the CDC, and while we were waiting for those samples to be tested, more cases started to be reported for more states. It was clear we had some sort of dramatic outbreak happening. And I remember sitting in my office like 10 o'clock at night waiting for the results to come in and we were going, please don't be smallpox, please don't be smallpox. And we were relieved to find out it was actually monkeypox, which is a close genetic cousin to smallpox. But now we had a real mystery on our hands. Monkeypox is only known to occur in Africa, never been reported in North America and certainly not in a North American mammal species. We had no idea how it had gotten here. So as a veterinarian, I'm, I'm privileged to get to work on a lot of things at CDC, but in this case, I was asked to lead the animal tracing investigation to try to figure out how these prairie dogs had gotten infected and what we were gonna do about it. And so the first step in any outbreak investigation is to interview cases. And by now we had you know, 70 plus case, 70 plus human cases associated with this outbreak in three different states. And everyone had a pet prairie dog or had, had come in contact with a pet prairie dog. So we traced where those prairie dogs had come from and they came from a dealer outside Chicago, Illinois. He literally was running a pet dealership out of his garage. And um, when we, we actually sent a team up there to, to investigate, and not only did he sell prairie dogs from his facility, he also sold African rodents. And at some point, they had mixed in that store, and the prairie dogs had gotten infected and gone on to infect all those people. But we didn't know where the African rodents had come from. And the pet industry is not very well regulated. There aren't a lot of receipts. You have to go by word of mouth. And we had to, we had to trace back through multiple intermediate dealers where these animals had come from. And we finally located a shipment of, of rodents that had come in for the pet industry from Ghana about six weeks before. This is a country in West Africa. The only problem was there were 800 animals in the shipment. And when we started tracing out where they had gone and we found some, many of them tested positive for monkeypox. So we had to presume the entire shipment was infected. And that meant we had to then trace where all those 800 animals went. So it was a very long investigation. We identified a real problem in being able to import rodents from Africa for the pet trade. CDC enacted emergency legislation during this outbreak banning the importation of rodents from Africa. And that effectively has stopped the outbreak and kept it from happening again. But we still have to worry about the illegal pet trade. They go and grab these rodents out of their burrows. They don't raise them in nice, clean facilities. And so whatever diseases they're harboring can, can come over and then be in a child's bedroom before you know it. So we remain worried about it. We remain vigilant. And we also remain worried about what diseases other animals are bringing in. Jennifer, did you activate the Emergency Operations Center to do that traceback? The Emergency Operations Center was activated for the entire response, and we did the traceback through the EOC. This is a, an incredibly important um, uh, capacity for us to have. Uh, some of you may remember the fungal meningitis cases from uh, a year or two ago, where there was a contaminated steroid injection. They were thousands of patients exposed. There were many who became ill. We activated the Emergency Operations Center, working with 23 state health departments. We were able to notify 14,000 patients within a few weeks so that they could get rapidly treated if they developed symptoms. So that ability to mobilize rapidly is so important, but it's not common enough around the world. And one of the things that we're doing around the world is helping other countries develop both this kind of disease detective program and the emergency operation capacity because if they can find a problem sooner and stop it, 
It's better for them and it's better for us. Neil? So, uh, thank you. And as Dr. McQuiston was telling you, monkeypox is just one member of this group of viruses known as orthopox viruses, which also includes smallpox. And fortunately, smallpox was eradicated in the late 1970s. And since then, we have stopped regularly vaccinating people against smallpox. But the thing with the smallpox vaccine is that it actually protects against more than just smallpox. It actually protects against other orthopox viruses, such as monkeypox. And so one of the questions we're interested in is whether new orthopox viruses will emerge in the years to come because people no longer have the protection that they once got through the smallpox vaccine. So for this next story, and, and as you can see here, I'm gonna take you to the country of Georgia, formerly part of the Soviet Union. And last year, we were contacted by our Georgian colleagues about two patients in rural Georgia who had a mysterious illness characterized by fever and these skin lesions filled with pus. Neither of these people had been vaccinated for smallpox before. So testing at CDC showed that both of these men were actually infected with a never before seen orthopox virus closely related to smallpox. So I led the investigation that went out to Georgia um, so we could learn more about this virus. And one of our concerns was that the two cases we had already heard about were just the tip of the iceberg and maybe more people were actually infected back in Georgia. So the team I led was composed of a diverse array of people, included veterinarians, laboratory scientists, physicians, epidemiologists. So as you can see, we had a very um, broad array of experts on our team so that we could take a comprehensive approach to this investigation. And during the course of our investigation, we found that people in the region had a history of exposure to orthopox viruses, though the exact circumstances behind their, um, their exposure remain unclear. And the other thing we found is that, again, we suspected that this virus had probably originated from animals, and indeed, we found evidence that orthopox viruses circulate among Georgian rodents, again, highlighting that animal-human um, health interaction. So um, for me, one of the most amazing aspects of this investigation is that we heard about these two patients in rural Georgia all the way at CDC in Atlanta, Georgia. That's thousands of miles away, and yet they still came to our attention. And that speaks to the work that CDC does around the world with building local capacity for public health, which is part of our overall global health security strategy. Now, some of you might also be wondering, why do we spend time studying obscure viruses like this? And particularly for a virus like this, it has the potential to mutate into a more deadly virus, just like smallpox is believed to have done many, many years ago. And the other thing to keep in mind is that smallpox is a potential agent of bioterrorism. So by understanding this virus and other orthopox viruses, we can better prepare ourselves for these types of threats. Neil mentioned some of our partnerships around the world. CDC is pretty well known for what we do in this country. And both Gallup and Pew do polling, and CDC ends up being the most trusted agency in the US government in all of those polls. But not too many people know what we do around the world. Uh, in fact, often the work that CDC does around the world is better known outside of the US than inside. We have staff uh, in 60 countries, about 2,000 staff, and work on a wide range of issues. And I think one of the most interesting and exciting ones is building the capacity to do this type of investigation and response uh, all over the world because that's going to be better for us. Years ago, the U.S. ambassador to Africa said to me that the CDC is the 911 for the world. And I thought, that's great. And the more I thought about it, I realized really what we'd like is to make sure that every single country has its own public health 911 because that'll be better for them and better for us. Jennifer? So both Dr. Vora and Dr. Frieden mentioned bioterrorism as sort of some of the underpinnings of why we do some of the work we do, some of the underpinnings of EIS itself. And so what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is 9-11. So on 9-11, most of our lives were changed forever. I, I had gone to work that day. I remember standing in the CDC lobby, and the guards had put it up on the television screen and watching, watching the World Trade Centers come down. Um, and I know all of America was so devastated by this, but um, unlike most Americans, I actually was pulled into action that day. I was actually able to feel like I was doing something because I was pulled onto the CDC advance plane that flew into Manhattan that night. 
So many of you may not know this. It's not a story that we necessarily talk about a lot. But CDC was the only plane allowed in the sky that day. And it was because it was thought to be so important to get public health people on the ground working with the New York City Health Department, whose infrastructure had been damaged. Their, their offices were very close to the World Trade Center. And trying to make sure that they got surveillance started in all the Manhattan hospitals to, to make sure there hadn't been a secondary bioterrorism attack in addition to the World Trade Center attacks. And we, um, we were a team of four people initially. We went and we liaisoned with the New York City Health Department and we, we came up with a plan. And the plan was we were going to put an EIS officer in every hospital in Manhattan. So we put 40 EIS officers in the belly of an Air Force cargo plane and flew them to New York City several days after the event. And we made sure that every person who came to the emergency room for the next six weeks was checked out in some way. We were looking for signs and symptoms suggestive of bioterrorism. We also ended up implementing surveillance for injuries associated with the World Trade Center recovery efforts. So we were able to implement public health things beyond just looking for bioterrorism. We're very fortunate that we didn't find any evidence of a secondary bioterrorism attack associated with that event. But by the end of those six weeks, the first anthrax letters that had been mailed through the US postal system had started to be reported. So all those EIS officers got called back to Atlanta to begin working on the next outbreak investigation. And I think that really characterizes what EIS is all about. You're, you're never still for very long. You're moving from one outbreak, one emergency to the next. It's always exciting. The other thing I think that the World Trade Center response, CDC's um, work in that illustrates is that we have a group of people ready to respond at any moment, at any time, and we can mobilize 40 people to go and work on an emergency. And I think that's the real value of EIS. CDC is both broad and deep. We have about 15,000 staff including some of the world's experts in just about every condition uh, imaginable. Uh, one of the things that we're very proud of is the work that CDC did with the World Health Organization in smallpox eradication. And uh, now the world is really at the cusp of polio eradication. Uh, the polio program is uh, so important and so challenging. If we can have the next slide, please. Um, uh, this is a polio vaccination program in Nigeria. Currently, there are only two countries in the world that still have polio that's never gone away, Nigeria and Pakistan. So every polio virus anywhere in the world is either a Nigeria polio virus or a Pakistan polio virus. And we can study them, their whole genome, and figure out which is which. Nigeria has made tremendous progress in the past 18 months. And part of the reason they've made that progress it's a great coalition of the government of Nigeria, state governments of Nigeria, uh, Rotary International, which does terrific work here, the Gates Foundation, World Health Organization, UNICEF. One of the things we did is we've created programs like the EIS program in other countries, including in Nigeria. And the program in Nigeria started about five years ago, and it was started by a graduate of the Kenyan program. So it's a great example of South-South learning. That program is getting the best and the brightest young doctors in Nigeria. And I met with them a couple of years ago and I said, you all know people who talk about smallpox eradication uh, because that was the most meaningful moment of their career and they are proud of it. Polio will be your smallpox. And so we turned loose the entire EIS class uh, of Nigeria, the Nigerian Field Epidemiology Training Program, and we tripled the class size and we said, go work on polio. And they went to uh, ultimately more than a hundred communities all over Nigeria and every month they would go and they would do a specific investigation and control measure, come back a month later, go back a month later and within really just a few months they had dramatically improved vaccination rates. That was one of many different things that's been used. So far this year we've only had four polio cases in Nigeria and there are lots of problems with polio eradication. There are lots of challenges. We have um, uh, violence against vaccinators in Pakistan and some in, in Nigeria as well. We have outbreaks in Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea. We just had a positive specimen uh, from Brazil, from the sewage system that matches genotypically with Equatorial Guinea polio. So someone who came over in advance of the World Cup uh, deposited something else 
uh, in, uh, in Brazil. We have outbreaks in Syria. We have positive samples in Israel. And with all of this, you can begin with Somalia. With all of this, you can begin thinking it's hopeless. But it's not. Because, in fact, when we began this work in 1988, there were 350,000 polio cases each year. And now we're really on the cusp of eradication. I think we have a reasonable chance of getting rid of polio from Africa this year. And then it will only be the Pakistan polio virus that we need to deal with. And I think uh, we can get over the finish line. Eradication is so exciting and has been so much a goal because it's the ultimate in both sustainability and equity. Because it's forever and for everyone. And that's what smallpox eradication has brought for smallpox, a terrible killer. And that's what polio eradication will bring for polio. So we've got tremendous progress in so many different areas. But I want to ask you each a question or two, and then we'll open it up to the audience. What are some of the most important take-home lessons you've taken from the outbreak investigations you've done? How do you uh, work between coming in as the outside expert and respecting the local expertise? And, and what have you really taken from the outbreak investigations that you've done? Well, um, I think along each of the investigations I described to you uh, internationally, we always work alongside our colleagues in those countries, particularly the EIS programs in those countries. So even in Nigeria, for that bat festival we investigated, um, some of those officers took a break from polio and actually worked with us on the bat investigation. And it's just so rewarding working with so many committed, talented people in, in, around the world um, who have these opportunities to do so much for their country. And quite frankly, it's more often the case that I'm learning from them than vice versa because they bring so much to the table with their, their understanding of the cultural circumstances and the local epidemiology. So I, f I found that really uh, inspiring, just the, the local capacity building around the world. You also, um, in the course of this type of work, develop a very healthy respect for how dangerous some of these um, diseases are. Um, but in addition to like, you know, we talk about Ebola or rabies, but in addition to that, there are other um, killers in these countries that we face every day, like traffic, just um, the number of people who die because of injuries in these countries. And, and it really opens your mind to the challenges that they face around the world. In fact, motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of death in Americans traveling outside of the U.S. And one of these epidemiology training programs in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, one of the officers by hand analyzed more than 10,000 traffic incidents, came up with an analysis of some of the causes of the traffic uh, fatalities, and his work led to the enactment for the first time of seatbelt laws, anti-distracted driving laws, anti-drunk driving laws, and were associated with a decline in motor vehicle fatalities. So you really see that what you're developing in EIS is a capacity. You're developing the ability of countries to collect analyze, interpret, and use their own data to improve their own health. How about you, Jennifer? What are some of the biggest lessons for you? Well, I can think of two. I, I think one of, the, one of the challenges, of course, if you are working internationally is you don't always speak the language, you don't always understand the culture. But I think one of the beautiful things about working in public health is that what we do sometimes transcends politics. So many times we have the opportunity to work in countries where maybe Americans aren't always welcome, but because we're there in a health capacity, we are. And so I always try to keep in mind that I'm there as an ambassador in many ways. And, and that the impression I leave will have long-term ramifications, either positive or negative. So I always try to make them be positive when I do that. Um, I think on an outbreak investigation, the thing I always try to keep in the back of my head going into it is that never presume you know what the cause is. Never presume you know what you're going to find when you get there. Let the data and the investigation carry you to the conclusion. And a great example of that is we, there's an expanding outbreak of a disease called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. You're in Colorado, so many of you know about Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. It's a tick-borne disease. Well, it's a disease that had never really occurred in Arizona before. It's a hot, dry desert there. It's not really a, a climate hospitable to ticks. But we began to get cases in American Indians in Arizona in the early part of 2000. And we sent an EIS officer out, and we, we really thought what she was going to find was that the, the range of that tick would have expanded southward from Colorado down into Arizona. We thought we were going to find the usual tick. 
And when we got there, no matter how hard we looked, we couldn't find that tick. And what we found was a completely different tick transmitting it. And, and it was a completely different epidemiology because the tick acted totally differently. And that was a lesson to me that I thought I knew what we were going to find when we went into it. And we had to trust our instincts to see what we saw in the environment was really what was happening. How about your own, I'll, I'll ask one more question and then open it up to questions from the audience. How about your own personal safety? How do you deal with that in an outbreak investigation? Um, you know, for me, the, the biggest concern is always the traffic, to be honest. I mean, you drive these long distances, and it's like, you just hope that someone doesn't fall asleep at the wheel. But in, in Nigeria in particular, I mean, we were traveling in these bulletproof vehicles with armed guards, with AK-47s. Um, and then when we get inside the bat cave, like you were describing in Uganda, I, I love animals, so I was in heaven. Uh, but the, the whole floor is literally alive with vermin. Um, there's bats flying all around you. There's stuff dripping on your head. You don't know if it's condensation or bat urine, to be frank. But um, it's, it's, you know, when you're dealing with these animals, you really have to have that healthy respect. Because if you, you know, of course, we use the personal protective equipment and that space suit. But um, you always have to realize you're dealing with unknowns. And you have to be careful for yourself and for others. And, and when you have a team underneath you, that, that raises the stakes because there's other people's safety that you're responsible for. Um, and so that's always very humbling. When I was an EIS officer in New York City, I wanted to continue to care for patients individually. So I arranged on Tuesday mornings to see patients in the tuberculosis clinic, really unrelated to the fact that I ended up working on tuberculosis for many years. Um, and uh, during my work in that clinic, volunteering in that clinic, I became infected with tuberculosis bacteria. Uh, didn't get sick with it. You can be either infected or sick, but I will probably have the infection in my body for the rest of my life. No adverse effects, no problems, but not good. Shouldn't have happened. No. And it happened, I'm sure, because in the room next to where I was seeing patients, they were getting patients to cough into a cup and develop sputum, but they didn't have that room at negative pressure to the rest of the clinic. So all of the infectious particles were wafting out of that room right into my room. So when I was assigned to become head of the tuberculosis program in New York City, I sent Peggy Hamburg, my boss, who's here today and tomorrow, a note saying, you have to get uh, the uh, sputum induction rooms fixed. And it doesn't take much. All you have to do is put an exhaust fan in. So the air goes from the inside to the outside, and sunlight immediately deactivates, kills the uh, tuberculosis bacteria. So we were able to do that within days. So one of the things you can do when you are at risk is analyze what happened or might have happened or could happen to you, and then use that to improve policies to make everyone safer. So I think as, I'm a woman, and sometimes I travel internationally by myself on outbreak investigations. So I think one of the things for my personal safety I'm always aware of is just sort of what the situation on the ground is and, and making smart decisions about how to protect yourself. Um, I always make sure I lock the hotel room and wedge something under the door, and I always make sure that I'm in, in my room by 7 or 8 o'clock at night. And, uh, you know, I do that in the United States, too, I guess. I think it's hard to predict what your personal safety on the ground is going to be. I've never really worried that I was going to catch the disease I was going to investigate. I mean, in reality, we know more about how to protect yourselves and prevent that than anybody. And we get, what, thousands of vaccinations before we travel internationally sometimes. Um, so for me, it's more the uncertainty of the security on the ground. And I can tell you, when I, I was 27 years old when I got on that plane on 9-11. And my mother was crying on the phone saying, don't go. And I said, I'm going. Um, so we, I think that is what different, differentiates an EIS officer is we go anyway sometimes, even when we don't know. In fact, there's an ethos at CDC that um, you have your bag packed at all times. And if you are not on a flight by sundown, someone else will be. So the EIS officer is always ready to go. Questions from the audience? Yes, we have uh, one here and one, and one here. First, first. We heard in the last hour about a recent law enacted in Nigeria making it unlawful to treat homosexuals with HIV. You all have some serious relationships with the Nigerian government, and I'm wondering if this is something on which CDC has a position or has made any effort to, uh, to ameliorate. So CDC provides about half of all of the treatment 
in PEPFAR, the Global AIDS Program, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. And uh, we've seen anti-homosexuality legislation in Uganda, Nigeria, and elsewhere, and we're very concerned about it. We're concerned about it from both a human rights perspective, and we're concerned about it from a disease control perspective. If people aren't comfortable coming forward, they will be more ill, they will spread infection more, and uh, the, these issues have gotten very politicized uh, in some of the countries, and what we're hoping is to gradually move it back to a rights-based approach, back to a care-based approach so that we're providing services to individuals. But it has real implications for us. Uh, for example, in some of our programs, we no longer record, in some of the countries where this is relevant, we no longer record the risk factor that people have uh, that has resulted in their HIV infection because that could result in negative consequences. But we want to figure out a way to make sure that we can get people the services that they need, but also work diplomatically through the State Department and others to try to get these laws changed. I will say that sometimes the worst way to do this is for Americans to say they should change them. So it's, it's important to figure out what's the most effective way to get change to occur within countries. Uh, in the early part of the uh, 19th, uh, 20th century, uh, we had uh, 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 quarantines of people with tuberculosis. I don't know of any other instances where, we've ha where that power has had to be exercised. Could you please uh, sketch a, uh, a scenario where quarantine could be necessary on, on a broad basis and indicate what uh, police powers uh, there are that would enforce such a, uh, uh, a state of affairs? Well, um, just to get terms right first, quarantine is the separation of healthy people in case they become ill. Isolation is the separation of sick people so they won't make other people infected. And um, both of those considerations do come into play. Uh, and I'll just mention three situations. Tuberculosis, MERS, and SARS. In tuberculosis, very rarely we have people who have TB and despite our best efforts refuse to take medications and are endangering others. So philosophically we say, your right to swing your fist ends at my nose. And your right not to take your anti-tuberculosis medicine does not extend to developing a drug-resistant form of TB that you cough into my face and infect me with. So what we've done, and, and actually New York City was at the epicenter of the outbreak of multidrug resistant tuberculosis, which I helped to document as an EIS officer, and then to control as the, the program manager there. And we rewrote the law because the law had been written in 1959 and there wasn't much in terms of uh, safeguards there. We made sure that every single patient was represented by counsel. We made sure that there was an individualized review of the situation. We made sure that there was a re-review periodically. We did not forcibly medicate anyone, but they had to stay until they were cured. So they were, and they, we didn't put them in a jail, we put them in a hospital. So tuberculosis is one area where we do isolation, sometimes mandatory. In SARS, quarantine was crucial. In fact, quarantine was one of the main things that allowed the world to control the SARS outbreak. Uh, even though we didn't have a treatment, even though we didn't have a vaccine, we knew that if we isolated the people who had SARS and had scrupulous infection control, they would not spread it to others. But before they had been diagnosed, they had exposed many people. And those people might develop SARS. And if they weren't isolated, they might then spread it through more and more generations of spread. So we actually quarantined, we globally quarantined quite a few people uh, because of SARS, um, and, and that was one of the most effective ways of actually stopping the outbreak. And we might have to do the same thing in MERS with exposure. It's been voluntary so far. So we had two patients with MERS in the US. Uh, they exposed, in one case, 14, in another case, more than 50 healthcare workers to their infection, not intentionally, before they were diagnosed. So those healthcare workers were furloughed. They were set, told, to go home, don't have contact with others for the incubation period, which is about 14 days. And if you don't get sick, then come back to work. But we're going to give you paid furlough 
uh, to essentially quarantine you for 14 days. I don't know, Neil or Jennifer, if you want to mention anything more. I, I would just say CDC is not generally thought of as a regulatory agency, but we do have some small powers with respect to things like this, and, and both in terms of what's being imported into the United States and then also, I think, um, trans patients moving from state to state. And um, there have been some not unrecent situations. There was a XDR TB case that CDC did exercise some of its regulatory authority to try to keep him from moving in airplanes, for example. But it, it's usually, we prefer to do it in a voluntary fashion rather than a regulatory. And fashion. often it's the state or local health department that has the authority there. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, let's see. Somebody pick one. <laughs> we need a microphone here in the back. Do we have, okay. Hi, Bob Wales from uh, San Diego. I know we learned quite a bit probably from the anthrax bioterrorist threat. What can we learn and can you give us some information about how we would handle a threat from like Ebola, which would be very devastating and if it's targeted to the right individuals, obviously it would be very lethal. Uh, what can you tell us about your work on, on prevention of bioterrorism with that? Whenever you want to start. Well, um, I'll just comment that there's a, there's a strong network of labs throughout the United States. And, and we really partner closely with local and state health departments. And like Dr. Frieden had mentioned before, it starts with an astute clinician. So someone who recognizes that there's something odd, that this, you know, this person has an illness that's characteristic of uh, you know, a possible bioterrorism related uh, pathogen. And so once that physician or clinician alerts a local health department or a state health department, they can sometimes do the, the rapid testing locally. And CDC is often involved at, a, at an early stage, but. Uh, you know, I would say that one of the reasons we, we do humanitarian efforts, where we do send staff to help investigate Ebola outbreaks, is that there's still a lot to learn about it. If we're gonna be prepared here in the event it was used as a bioterrorism agent, we need to know as much as we can. And so CDC is involved with research that helps establish whether there are vaccine candidates and, and all sorts of things, all in the hopes of better preparing us for something like that. But I would say I don't think Ebola is probably the most likely agent of bioterrorism. I, it, it doesn't last very long in the environment, is my understanding. And I think the ideal bioterrorism agent is, is a little more long-lived than Ebola. Yeah, as Jennifer said, we're, we're generally not a regulatory agency, but if you want to import plague or work with it in your lab, then we regulate you. And one of the things that we can do is make sure that laboratories that work with these agents are, are working with them safely. Yes, can you, can you expand on that comment that was just mentioned as it relates to uh, various viruses that are resistant to existing uh, antibacterial medications, uh, how you handle that. Do you work in conjunction with the pharmaceutical companies uh, or the FDA to accelerate a cure? Is that a, is, do you understand the question? Yeah. Absolutely. Really, I think there are three major challenges uh, that face us in the infectious disease world. Emerging infections like monkeypox um, or SARS or MERS, resistant infections. We're now seeing infections resistant to all antibiotics and intentionally created infections, something that, that a terrorist makes or that's made and unintentionally gets out of a laboratory. In resistant infections, we really are at risk of losing antibiotics. We are at risk of being in a post-antibiotic era. Uh, one of the things that we've done at CDC is to shine a light on this, to do surveillance, to track what's happening around the country and sound the alarm. We have certain organisms that are very concerning, some of them homegrown, some of them coming from other countries. And now we have implementation programs working with CMS and FDA and the American Hospital Association and others and our top priority right now is to make sure that every hospital in the country has an antimicrobial stewardship program to make sure that antibiotics are being used correctly, not excessively. We see that between a third and a half of antibiotics are unnecessary or excessive. So we want to get it right so patients get the right treatment. Uh, so there are many things that can be done, but building the global capacities in this area is also very important. Let's take a few more questions. Uh, um, one in the yes. front and who's got the microphone? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. Thousands of children are crossing 
the Mexican border and coming into America, and they're coming in from South America and Africa and all sorts of places unknown. What is being done by the Centers of Disease to protect Americans because those children are being sent to relatives throughout America? What's being done to protect the rest of the American people? Yeah. The, the situation uh, on the border, if we can take the microphone and, and uh, bring it here, is, is really uh, very moving. Now, there is a federal response that's run by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Organization, that's dealing with a very complex legal and humanitarian problem. These are kids who've sometimes walked for 15 hours and they're coming in quite ill. They come from Central America for the most part and actually vaccination rates are very high in Central America. There's, there is just one disease, chickenpox, that is not routinely vaccinated for in most of the countries of Central, Central America. So what is being done is they're being vaccinated against chickenpox when they come in. Uh, so that that would reduce the risk of chickenpox. But there are certainly medical needs that need to be addressed, and we've been uh, ad uh, advising in a consultative fashion uh, the folks who are dealing with that full time. I think we had a question here. And do we have a second microphone? Maybe in the back while we're waiting? Go ahead. Right here. Thanks. The very last. What are the significant similarities and differences between human and non-human or uh, originated uh, disease? Well, you know, if you look at emerging infections, by which I mean new infectious diseases, um, the majority of them, nearly 70%, have originated from animals. So there's a lot of this actually sharing of pathogens. Like, like Dr. Frieden was saying before, bats are mammals, and so they have certain viruses that they can more easily pass on to humans as opposed to other non-mammal animals, that their viruses might not be as easily transmitted to humans. And you look at the array of pathogens with an animal origin, it's really astounding. Everything from SARS, HIV, rabies, even malaria are thought to have these animal origins. And so a lot of the work that particularly Dr. McQuiston and I work on looks at how humans and animals interact because of that possibility of, of transmission between uh, animals and humans. Do you want to add anything, Jennifer? I would just say, you know, I look, I studied comparative anatomy. I look at humans as just another animal in many cases. And I think that the viruses and bacteria that infect many animal populations are naturally going to infect us too. I always presume a disease has the potential to jump species unless proven otherwise. In the white shirt in the back? Oh, okay. So thank you, doctors. I'm curious about um, any implications of climate change on the kind of outbreaks that we're seeing in the U.S. You know, I will say that um, the emergence of this new tick species in Arizona, for example, has taken us by surprise. And we are looking at whether warmer weather might be accounting for its, their population numbers. And also, there's some data that suggests that particular tick bites humans more readily at warmer temperatures. And so, you know, if climate change is happening, it really does highlight that there could be uh, public health repercussions that maybe we haven't thought about. Time for a few more questions. Hans? Uh... Hi. Um, so I was just, um, from my perspective, I've seen you, or I've heard you guys talk a lot about um, physical illness. Um, and really, with my generation, I guess my biggest concern um, which is very evident within the, you know, multiple school shootings, um, 15 a year now, um, is really the mental health of America. And I was just wondering how you guys were addressing that or tracing that potentially back to um, antidepressants or pharmaceutical companies, um, because I really think that's right now the biggest killer, um, especially with suicide in my generation, and I think it's just going to get worse. Um, so I was just wondering how you guys were addressing the mental health. So we start with shining a light on the problem doing surveillance, tracking, seeing what the situation is, and trying to understand what the risk factors are for uh, mental illness or for suicide or for uh, violence or for other problems. Right now, we're seeing a huge problem with prescription opiate abuse. Uh, and it's entirely caused by doctors. Uh, we are, have seen basically a 400% increase in the prescription of opiates. Sometimes the treatment becomes the problem. Uh, any of the school shootings? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. But the prescription opiates now kill more people than heroin and cocaine combined. Mm -hmm. 
And in fact, about three quarters of heroin users these days started with prescription opiates. So I think we need to, I don't think we're going to find one simple solution. I think we have uh, a need to uh, deal with supportive school environments. We need to deal with availability of services. We need to deal with a whole host of things that different communities can decide to address violence. But we have a whole center at CDC for injury prevention and control. And they look at things like uh, what are the things that work to reduce uh, injury. Injury is the leading cause of death for 5 to 40 year olds in this country. And that includes car crashes and uh, drug overdoses and violence uh, and suicide. So well these are, is that? sorry? How well funded is that program? None of our programs are as well funded as we like them to be. <laughs> In the back, please. Um, uh, two questions. The first question is about the coronavirus. Uh, uh, basically, it's, it's emerging now in the Middle East with a death of uh, almost reaching 250. And there is still there's kind of a, in a black box. We don't know exactly what's, uh, uh, what's around it and what started and what's the host. The second part, you also shared with us the management of your side when it comes to the human part, but what do you do with the infected animals and um, uh, specifically when it comes to something like quite wide spectrum like bats or cattle or so? Thank you. So I'll take the first one and Jennifer will take the second. Uh, we're working very closely with the government of Saudi Arabia, of UAE, and of Jordan to, to help them get a handle on the outbreak of MERS coronavirus. And we, in the last few months, we've learned a great deal. It now is increasingly clear that the large increase of cases there was overwhelmingly nosocomial, that is, spread in hospital. And that's both bad news and good news. It's bad news because it shouldn't happen. It's good news because it's relatively easy to control. We began doing some studies to try to figure out where did the first cases start. We have suggestions that there may be a camel uh, 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 source of this. Uh, but the more we investigated cases, the more we found that they were almost all associated with hospitals. So that's the first important finding that we have, and we've seen a, a really a plummeting of cases over the last couple of months since we identified that. We've embedded CDC staff with the, the Saudi response, and we're seeing a lot of progress in that area. We now want to try to identify those initial sporadic cases to understand what the source might be. Jennifer, how about animal control? So I think it's important to understand that CDC is primarily a human health agency. And so we actually don't have a lot of authority or ability to work on the diseases when they're happening in animals unless they're associated with an active human outbreak. There are many vets, there are many physicians who work on animal-borne diseases at CDC. But I think the key here is that we recognize that we live in such an interconnected world that the idea of one health becomes very important, that what's happening in the animal population impacts what happens in the human population. So we work with our partners. We work with the United States Department of Agriculture. We work with local veterinarians. And we try to, when we don't have a piece of that puzzle, we try to connect with partners who do. Um, and we try to make sure that we're covering all those bases. We have time for one or two more questions. Um, um, let's see. I think there are two in the middle. If we'll take both of your questions, then that'll be it. Um, I have a question. If somebody. Um, has an interest in whether the CDC is working on anything in particular. Is there something on your website where you can, you know, like ask a question to find out if you guys are doing research on a particular issue or something that someone has an interest in or is happening somewhere they are planning on visiting? Yeah, you can always start with the CDC website. We also have apps, including something called the Yellow Book, which uh, is the, the Bible for anyone who wants to travel anywhere in the world, what, what to do or what to know or what to worry about there. Uh, we also uh, have 1-800-CDC-INFO. So if you ever want information, you can always call us. Last question. In, in the back. Good evening. I have a question regarding the spread of whooping cough, which has uh, now in Southern California there are outbreaks in certain areas. Uh, recently had friends uh, fly from Italy to LAX with a woman who was infected with whooping cough. And I'd like to know um, what regulatory body would have uh, input or control or, 
or the authority to isolate those people because so many people are exposed. My friend, it's been over a year now and she's been rushed to the hospital several times, hooping, uh, can't catch her breath. And when this woman was coughing, she was hooping. I mean, they, they could hear her hooping, she, and they were sitting, she was sitting between them, and both of them were infected. What can we do as citizens, and especially those of us who, who happen to travel quite a bit, to put pressure on those individuals or those, those, that particular, uh, those authorities to somehow control this because it seems to be getting out of hand. I know during the bird flu right. when I was flying uh, back and forth to the East Coast, I would see a lot of, of individuals coming from that at that point was China uh, or parts of the Asian continent uh, wearing masks. Yeah. Now, why don't we right. uh, insist upon that? And what, what uh, role would you have in that if, I don't know if it would be very limited, but that's a, a big concern of mine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So whooping cough or pertussis is, uh, is resurging for two reasons. One, we're not vaccinating enough people because people have misconceptions about vaccine and think that these diseases are things of the past. Second, the whooping cough vaccine is not as effective as we would like. So uh, it seems to wane. Our EIS officers did a number of investigations. We identified that it, it, the immunity wanes after about three years. It works, but it works for about three years, plus the whooping cough bacteria has evolved and seems to be evading some of our vaccines. So we're, this is a question of us working with the FDA and industry to try to come up with a better vaccine. In terms of regulatory action, certain things are appropriate for that, certain things not. It's often the state or local government that has the authority in terms of People coming into this country, CDC operates quarantine stations in all of the major, major ports of entry, but really the solution there is not to try to build a perfect moat around the country. The solution is to help control diseases all over the world because then other people will be safer and we'll be safer as well. So I don't know if you want to say any last words, Jennifer or Neil? Dr. Out of, out of time. Out of time. I, I don't know about you, but I think I'm going to sleep a lot better tonight knowing that these incredibly talented public health officials are Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay.